Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for an evening of romance authors with romance authors Allie Hazelwood, Nikki Payne, and Denise Williams. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests. We have Allie Hazelwood, a number one New York Times bestselling author of Love Theoretically and The Love Hypothesis, as well as a writer of peer-reviewed articles about brain science in which no one makes out and that ever after is not always happy. Originally from Italy, she lived in Germany and Japan before moving to the U.S. to pursue a Ph.D. in neuroscience. When Allie is not at work, she can be found running, eating cake pops, or watching sci-fi movies with her three feline overlords and her slightly less feline husband. Her latest is Bride, a paranormal romance published on February 6th. We also have Nikki Payne. <clears throat> By day, Nikki Payne is a curious tech anthropologist asking the right questions to deliver better digital services. By night, she dreams of ways to subvert canon literature. Nikki's a member of Smut U, a premium feminist writing collective, and a cat lady with no cats. Her latest is Sex, Lies, and Sensibility, a contemporary diverse retelling of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility, published on February 13th. And then last but not least, Denise Williams, uh, who wrote her first book in second grade, I Hate You, and its sequel, I Still Hate You featuring a tough, funny heroine, a quirky hero, woody banter, and a dragon. Um, minus the dragons, these are still the books she likes to write. After penning those early works, she finished second grade and eventually earned a PhD. Denise lives in Iowa and can usually be found reading, writing, or thinking about love stories. Her books have been listed as the Indie Next pick, Library Reads pick, and received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly and Library Journal. Her latest is Technically Yours, a story of second chance romance set in the STEM industry workplace and published in December. All right. So I'm going to have all of the authors come off mute. Can I just say Allie Hazelwood is an amazing book model. Like you have a gift. She beat Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> really was top tier. I, it's, it's, I was, this is my, my calling. Like, this yeah. is what I want to do. When I was little, I want to become a book model and I made it. Honestly, you have the hands for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nobody talks about that enough. It's true. It's true. It's a profession that is not valued as much as it should be. Because of patriarchy, which isn't the focus of our discussion. But. <laughs> not Great tonight. tonight. Yes. <laughs> well, it could be. It's up to you. <laughs> Um, could you each tell us a little bit more about uh, your work and yourself? That is so, so open. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you would like to share with us. Ooh, it's so open. <laughs> Maybe something I, we didn't already talk about. I cannot possibly go first. Uh, otherwise, I would just overshare everything about like... <laughs> I'm gonna need someone else to put like constraints on me <laughs> okay the midwesterner in me can't stand the silence so um <laughs> um I would say uh if you look across all my books and me uh I like to show smart professional women getting it and um kind of finding their way in life i think that's kind of my my brand that's my theme that's what you see in in all my books and for me my job is like my writing job but also my day job is so important to me and it's so meaningful to me and it fills me in so many ways that it, um you know as you get to know me and you get to know my characters that's really resonant in both places um where all my characters really are pulling purpose and value and love from that as they're learning to be in love in other ways. Um, something interesting about me is that when I was a child, I used to listen to um, hip hop songs and not just like really love the song, but also try to find what song was the base of that. So I'm listening to Biggie and I'm like, oh, and I'm trying to go find like Juicy to understand the genealogy of the song. And now so many people have even sampled Biggie that it kind of start, starts to kind of lose its um, like origin story. But all of that to say that for a long time, 
I have always been interested in not just the original thing, like a Jane Austen or classical literature, the foundation of something, but I've also found just great joy in how people can reimagine or retell um, the same story in a different way and create something completely new. Juicy is its own song that is fantastic in its own right. But when you put it and make it about, you know, an up and coming hip hop star hypnotized, it becomes a different story yet with that same foundation. And I just, I love to do that in my work as well. Yeah, I feel like what I have to say about me is sort of like a mix of what you guys are saying. I um I started writing in fan fiction. I, I wasn't like a I didn't have a like I wasn't writing fiction as I was growing up uh, but then uh, uh, when I was in the last semester of my PhD I was writing my dissertation and I was so overwhelmed uh, with just um, academic writing that I I sort of kind of became uh, I've always been very obsessed with fictional characters and fictional stories but I think for me that semester was the semester that I was like, I, I need more. And so I started writing fan fiction and, and that's kind of how my love of writing came about. So, yeah. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. So Ali and Denise touched a little bit on their day jobs. And I'd like to talk to all of you a little bit about your day jobs. And I know you all have PhDs. How does that impact your writing or does it or is it an escape like Ali was saying? I don't, sorry. <laughs> I would say it's definitely an escape. Um, I think all of us um have jobs because of the nature of our work that people depend on us to think very deeply about very serious issues, and some some of that is life and death, and some of it is like, um, it creates like all of these like larger issues, and there are these moments when. Like your only problem in the world is like how to get these two characters to kiss, right? And and that is a becomes a haven, at least for me. Yeah, you know, I agree. And I, I recently switched jobs, so I don't deal as much with the life and death anymore. But, you know, sometimes it felt like getting those two to kiss was the harder problem to solve than the, this other issue. And, um, and I love that. So for me, and I, I worked with college students um, for 15, 20 years. That's what my degree is in, in education. And um, it wasn't, it started as an escape. And I, I still refer to writing as my side hustle, even though it's not really that. Like, it's a full-time, like, job now. But um, it feels like an escape, and in part because the ending is happy, whereas in so much of the real world, the ending is uncertain. And I think in that way, the escape is is in a lot of ways solidified. Um, I'm sure we can all talk more about if the question is more toward the logistical area of how does that work with your writing. And I don't know for the other two, for me, it means I don't sleep that much and my lunch hours become um, times for copy editing, but um, th that's a different question. But I think Nikki is nail on the head. Like there's an escape there that is so different from the brain work we're doing in these other spaces. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's uh, I think for me, especially starting out and not, now this is my full-time job. Um, so it's a little bit different, but especially when I was starting out with writing, there was something very cathartic about like being able to because I, I wrote fan fiction but I set a lot of my fan fictions within academic settings and STEM settings and so it was really just fun to take all these you know daily problems that I would have because I had to write a dissertation I had to deal with my mentors I had to deal with my you know the people who were in my lab and have my favorite characters and kind of transplant them in the same situations I was in and kind of look at how would the crew of the enterprise <laughs> reacted to you know the problems I was dealing with and it was so fun so there was like such a an element of escap escapism especially at the beginning um and then yes you know it, it becomes uh, like everything it becomes hard when you start having to have you know copy edits and uh, you know edits and more edits and then more edits but you know um there's still that element of I get to lose myself in this world so in a way it's an escape, but do you also, is it while you're dreaming about how to get the characters to kiss and all that, are you pulling inspiration from 
relationships that you've been in or people that you know or quirks? Is there some part of your daily life that you find incorporated in it? Oh, yeah. You know, I would say not in my characters, like in the love stories themselves and the relationships. Those are fictional. I don't I don't base my characters on any individual person, but I I look at the world as meet cutes. If I'm I wrote a whole book about airports, but if I'm in the airport, I fly a lot. Um, I've come up with 19 different ways people could fall in love, like during my layover. Uh, most of them are bad, but you know, they're, they're there. So I see the world in meet cutes and I think there's something lovely about that because it's imagining sort of that everybody has this love story. And in that way, I think like my real life inspires my writing. And then, you know, there's quirks, there's settings, there's ways people speak. But for me, my, my characters really are completely fictional they're amalgamations of some people I love sometimes um but they're not really based on any one person which I guess makes it easier to like turn the screws on them and ruin their life pretty consistently I would agree um I would agree except my characters are all amalgamations but I also use my characters to um grind particular axes um in my to stand on soapboxes like, hey, let's talk about who the the real relationship was for the Avatar. Like, why was she with Aang, right? Like, we're just going to have it out in the book, right? Is LeBron versus, my, like, who is the better athlete? We can talk about that. Who is the better person? Actually unmatched, right? Like, we don't have to go there. We, but, but I use my characters absolutely to grind axes in my real life. But yeah, they aren't based on real people. Yeah, same. You you borrow a lot, I think, from, you know, something that will happen to you and you're like, this is such an interesting, you know, it, it's never a full person. It's usually just like a little bit of a slice of them. Like you see someone in a situation react in a way that you wouldn't. And you're like, this is so interesting. Uh, wouldn't it be amazing to have a character do that? But for me, it's the same. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, maybe it's because I'm a fan fiction person, but uh, I, I also... I borrow a lot from media that I watch or from books that I read, not in the sense of like copying a story, but more like, you know, you read something and or you watch something and there is a part of it that really resonates with you. And you're like, well, maybe this is not the focus of this specific, you know, book or movie, but wouldn't it be cool if there was a book about that and you kind of get to explore that? So playing off of that, do you all have like... <clears throat> authors or movies or certain books I I mean I know for um Nikki and Ali definitely some inspiration from the fanfic and the Jane Austen and all that but are there favorite romance authors that you get a lot of inspiration from or movies or authors in general um I don't know that there's authors or movies I get like content inspiration from um, but I think there's definitely authors that I read that inspire me to write better, more effectively, like with more heart to take risks. Um, Kennedy Ryan is the first one that comes to mind. And if you haven't read Kennedy Ryan, what are you even doing with your life? Like, I truly think she's the best romance author in the game right now. And, um, so when I read her books, it inspires me to take risks in my writing and to, to go deeper with my characters. So I'm not writing the same content that she is we're not writing the same plots and we don't even really write the same way but um I think that there are authors like her like Adriana Herrera like Mia Sosa um who really to me like I read them and it just it makes me want to it makes me want to write I guess and, and for lack of a better term when I'm reading their books um even though again what I'm writing and pulling from is is very different um that I don't really have a specific place that is happening but I think that those are folks who are like well fillers for me um, that I know I can safely pick up any one of their books and it's going to inspire me to go get off my butt and start writing um, and that, you know, that I can create something. Influenced by um, music, of course, all of those authors are just heavy plus one on everything Denise said. Um, and, and music, this is just an, um, to augment that. Um, music sometimes I'm sitting there and listening to a song and now you're in the head of a character and how is this person feeling this way so I'm just sitting there and I'm listening to like Beyonce's Lemonade album 
or something. And you're just like, how do we challenge, like channel that rage into something else? Like, how do we build that arc into something else? Or you're listening to just like the, the most delicate song that is just full of heartbreak. And it can take you to some place where you weren't feeling just before when you weren't listening to that song. So um, when we talk about how we use media, I absolutely um, read a ton of authors to, to get into that space too, but music in particular can just bring me into the head of some someone else. I feel like it's such a, a bridge for empathy building. Um, so absolutely music. Yeah, so true. Like music is, you know, the best. I feel like you can tell just from how many romance books uh, have playlists and how many, rom like so many romance books have, uh, you know, titles that are, like maybe lyrics or changed versions of lyrics but you recognize uh, like where they're from uh, there is such a connection between music and romance uh yeah I mean I I come from fan fiction so I definitely like get inspired by characters uh, and I fell, fall in love with characters and I treat fictional characters plus like they are normal people because that's like they are actual people that I live with and and that's that's what I do and i I don't know why. <laughs> and then uh, my favorite romance authors, like the ones that I think were most formative to me were Nalini Singh and, and Sherry Thomas. I was just reading them so much at a point in my life when just reading was so important to me and so all consuming. And Nalini Singh writes paranormals and, and contemporary. Um, and uh, like she creates these words that I just want to be in these words. And Sherry Thomas has just this prose that is amazing to me. And uh, um, she writes uh, she writes mysteries actually right now. And I'm like, I I devour them. So those are yeah. Like there is something about reading authors that you really like that makes you want to write not necessarily because you want to like imitate them but just because you're like oh something like this exists in the world I I want to like just kind of share space with them somehow you know yeah interact and work off of it so yeah. when you're being put in like the headspace listening to a song or um reading something do your characters come to you like fully formed for all of you or is it like a piece like oh that would be interesting to explore let me flesh out a character for that how does that work uh you know for me it's usually vibes I think my editor wished they came to me a little more fully formed than they do um but uh you know for me it's the vibes like I think Nikki I'm in the same way I'll hear a song and I think oh that's like what they're thinking and feeling like that if my like here's a secret for me if my characters are dancing to a song that's because the song that's the song I was listening to on repeat while I wrote that scene like you know I think it helps you get in their head but for me that gives you the vibe of them and then there's work to tease out like what's their history what's their emotional wound what's the lie they believe what uh brings them to this place what's their goals um and, and I think uh, other writers have that that skill for those to kind of come to them fully formed that's certainly not me like there's a lot of trial and error but the vibes are what kind of sparks the vibes maybe the premise or maybe their job honestly um, and then figuring out what that all means to them I think characters come come on you really slowly um, I think in the writing and in the revision you get to know that character I don't know like most authors know so much more about a character than what is on the page like you can ask like Denise what did Cord have for breakfast yesterday and she was like mm, a, a granola to bagels like it's just weird the level of like exactly um so there's so much knowledge that goes into building this person on the page that's not even that's not even actually you won't ever see that on the page so those characters come come to us slowly but it's it's in abundance it really is I think that's why so many of us write fan fiction of our own characters, uh, or maybe that's just me, but I'm like, I need you to know that he had cinnamon raisin bagels for breakfast and then something sexy happened, not involving the bagels, just they were in the periphery. And then, <laughs> um, but you know, we fall in love with these fictional little strangers, these little weirdos that we created. And it's hard to just let that go, I think, because they become so real for us that that is it's it's so true and like I am currently I I'm on that line I'm editing my 
my book that I have to turn in in four days, even though I will be asking for an extension, spoiler alert, in case my editor is here. But um, I guess uh, like my my first draft of this book is 150,000 words. And that is not like a book that is going to get published because my editor is not going to put 150,000 words uh, <laughs> on, like in print. So it's just there is so much more that you write about your characters and uh, also stuff that you get to know as you write the story and then by the end of the story you know exactly like you said what is it that they believe about themselves and the world and how that changes and like right now I'm editing you know the first half of my book and I'm like why did I make her say this like it's not in character at all but at the time when I was writing it I thought it was in character so Clearly, there has been, you know, like this character and I, uh, her name is Scarlett. Scarlett and I got to know each other in the last couple of months as I wrote her. So, you know, that's that's kind of fun as a process. So as these like fully formed characters kind of take up free rent in your head after you finish the books, is that why I noticed that each of you kind of like slightly put in a reference here or there? in some of your books alluding to other characters is that because they're just living in your head and you kind of want to interact with them again or is that like a fan service thing I think it's both um that is uh I think uh in some ways a genre expectation of if you're writing in the same universe if you're writing in series that's very common in romance and so as a reader I love those like little Easter eggs where you're like things are happening I know that yes. name. I know that place like and so um, when I'm writing in the same universe, I, I think for me, it's it's just because I love those characters, but also uh, I think readers really like that. And and from a just strictly, I don't know, business sense, I think it makes folks wonder like, oh, I read Britta and Wes and technically yours. And I can be like, oh, here's their story in this other book, not this book. I'm not as good as Allie. I'm not holding anything up. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pieces to that. Yeah. Also, uh like I love reading a book and being updated on what a couple that I've wrote read previously about is doing like what well, this happened to me for example with Nikki I was reading uh, Sex, Lies and Sensibilities and I'm like oh, oh my god Lisa and Darcy this is what is happening to them and I just love that you know it just in general so because I love it because I love to experience it as a reader I I do that as a writer I guess you know yeah, no, I agree. Like Julia Quinn, every time another couple gets married um, <laughs> uh, in Bridgerton, right? Like you, you get to hear about the other couple, like the Sherwood Brides, Catherine Coulter, like everyone, like once you're building this universe, you also kind of own that universe and you get to tell people that, hey, these people actually did make the right decision. They're still together. They, they still love each other. And you know what I'd like to see more in romance is more like vengeance updates, like the villains, we get like a little update on them in the epilogue, but I'd really like to see more of villains still suffering yeah. in later books. And and that's not really part of our genre. That's not how we roll. We're like, oh, everybody's happy. They're getting married. They're having kids. They're having all these professional successes. But like, what if we had like some more villain comeuppance? Yeah. I guess that's my challenge to us as romance readers and writers is, is to demand um more pain for the villains this oh. is why I love Denise it's the bloodthirst like I I I identify deeply with that I am a petty person and so <laughs> if you do something mean to someone I want to see you pay for yes. many books <laughs> yeah yeah okay that's not what you ask but I just needed to float that into the universe we Can should I do that more I I will try to include this more in my books agree the villains <laughs> the villain cut <laughs> little bonus chapter at the end bonus chapter the villain edit yeah yeah oh yeah that would be fun so speaking of characters were there any characters that you like had a really hard time writing or some that you like totally loved and didn't want to leave I'd say by the end I didn't want to leave any of them by the end of every book at least so far maybe not the one I'm currently in revision for but that'll come um, I, I love them at the end. There have been many characters that were like I hit a, a wall with. Um, one of my airport novellas, The Sweetest Connection, ended up being my favorite of that whole series. I 
adored it, but I was trying to write the wrong thing is what the challenge was. And so I was trying to write these characters with the wrong motivations. And so I ended up having such a hard time and I wasn't enjoying it. And my working title for that book was Garbage Book, which I think my editor would like me to stop saying <laughs> in interviews. But again, like it was just so hard to write and it felt like it would never come. And then I took a step back and I did what good writers should do and figured out their goals. And then it, I wrote it in like a week and a half and it was so easy. So for me, the only time I really struggled with writing a character, it's because I, as the author, was trying to write the wrong thing for them. And once I gave up my control freak tendencies that, you know, solved the problem. But in the end, I love them all. Yeah. I feel like um, there was a character, Lou, who took me a very long time to understand. I I couldn't understand why she wanted this particular thing and what what was in it for her. And um, And one of the things that I got is like advice particularly about like secondary characters is that, um, oh gosh, sorry, that was very loud. Um, particularly about secondary characters is that first, of course they should like represent and help the main characters, but they should also like have this drum to beat, essentially like have this, this one idea or one theme that represents them. And I was trying to make her represent too many things at once. And I just wanted to crystallize her desire down into one thing. So when you thought of Lou, when you thought of these side characters, then you think of that one thing. And you and every decision you know is threaded by the one thing that you know that they want. I love Lou. I mean, I don't love Lou, but like it's she's so important for the anyway. Yeah. Um I no, I I think for me my hardest character was the one for the next book that's gonna come out. Uh like it was the first time that it happened to me that I've read a book and then I had actually two people, my editor and then a friend of mine who read the book. And uh, they kind of both told me the same thing, which was uh, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna condense it into she's unlikable, but it's not really what they said because you know, I don't think uh, characters have to be likable, but they have to be relatable and uh, they were like, I don't understand her. She's not giving me anything. And that's because I was trying to write a character who had certain issues. And I think I wasn't being very honest about what her issues were on page because it was from my point of view. And so I was like, well, she's not going to be honest about her own issues. But I kind of realized that I had to give the character a little bit more. And that was such a hard character for me to write. And at some point I was like, oh, I hate her. Can't I? I'm just going to write another Sunshine character who is happy, whatever. And then, you know, there was a point where I, I think I sort of got her and I was like, you know, I, I love her and I will protect her with my life. Uh, so it was uh, it was an experience for us. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like you all hit roadblocks. I mean, understandably have hit roadblocks before. Are you planners or do you run kind of by the seat of your pants? Are you pantsers? Do you plan it all out? And then if it's not going exactly how you want, you rework it? Because it sounds like we're doing that with characters. Is that what we're doing with plot too? Yeah, so in my heart, I am a pantser. I want to sit down with no plan and then create a magician love story from the ether. And um, that was just to dig at Nikki who thinks magicians can't be sexy, but I believe that she's wrong. Um, and so anyway, unrelated, um, I, that's how I would love to write, but, um, in traditional publishing and at least with our publisher, they don't, they don't give you money if you don't have a plan. Uh, so like as part of the business, I've become uh, a plotter and I'm actually just listening to, um, story genius by Lisa Crone, Cron. And it's about kind of building a blueprint. And I love the idea of that. So it's not like a, a full synopsis. It's not a detailed plan, but it's really a blueprint of character motivations and letting that drive story. Um, and I think that really like lines up with how I like to write. But I, I think I've written some good stuff with no plan. So that in my heart, that is how I like to write. Story Genius was recommended to me by many people and I've never read it. Like I'm more of a save the cat person, but I I clearly have to. But uh, yeah, I, I love that because we all share a publisher and uh, yes, they want, they apparently want to know what you're going to write before, before they allow you to write it. Right. That is 
terrible of them. Like, how dare they, right? right. And uh, um, okay, so this is not my joke. It's uh, a joke by Sarah Simone, and uh, I heard of it heard it from Adriana Herrera. So I have to give credit, but they said like the, the joke is I'm not a pencer nor um uh, uh nor a planner. I'm a panty liner, which I feel like it's uh, so true for me because I have to plan for you know I have to plan for for the publisher, but then in the end everything gets gets thrown out, and so that it's a mix of both. Would you say the same for you, Nikki? Oh, yeah. I I do this thing where I just write a note about what has to happen in the scene, right? Tina's got to get to the grocery store, no matter what. And my entire like draft it are is a collection of those sentences. Tina has to get to the grocery store. Mike has to punch this person in the face. And those things have to happen. But I give myself within that framework of Tina has to get to the grocery store, she could fly, yeah. she could, you know, take this, like, and whatever happens at the beginning, it has to be a complete surprise to the character by the end, right? To say, like, she just thinks she's going to the grocery store, obviously something else happens. Um, and so that's, those are the only rules I give myself. So I think it's a kind of a hybrid approach. You have a structure and you know you have to write within those boundaries, but I give myself a lot of freedom for how something takes place within the boundaries. What about the research that goes into your book? Is there like a lot of research up front or is it as the story progresses, you start going down different rabbit holes? How does that work? There's a lot of research um, for, for me. I just personally um, love to do it. I think everyone has their own way to like go into um, that process, but um as an anthropologist, I just like to talk to people and just like be in their space, just like see what's in their refrigerator and just be completely obnoxious. So for Sex, Lies and Sensibility, like I traveled to Maine and spoke with community leaders, particularly in the um, Abenaki Confederacy and spoke with artists and just regular citizens and chatted them up about the things that was that were like keeping them up at night or what was fun and funny and interesting. How would they indicate that they were falling in love with someone? Just really small things that ended up um, becoming really important to to building a character like Bear. Yeah, you know, I'd say I agree. There's a lot of research that goes into the books and it's really in, in different ways. And so, um, for example, in my debut, How to Fill Up Flirting, the heroine's a survivor of um, relationship violence and workplace harassment. And so there was a lot of research, there was a lot of my own knowledge of that, but there was also a lot of talking to people who have lived through that, who have worked in advocacy, who have worked in these spaces, um, in thinking about not how do I tell somebody's story, but how do I triangulate the story I'm telling? And that is a very kind of um, personal, let me learn about people type of research versus in The Misconnection, when I wrote about two chemistry professors, I, as somebody who had a bachelor's degree in psychology, PhD in education and failed freshman chemistry, had to write like PhD level chemists and give them a, you know, realistic um, research agenda, all for like three throwaway jokes. But that was a very different kind of research that was learning and studying. And um, Margot, shout out to you, because you spent two hours on the phone with me explaining chemistry to me as well. But I think, you know, what the book demands is what most of us are doing. In addition to, I think what Nikki was saying of getting to know people, then there's just, oh, I decided to write an astrophysicist. I guess I need to learn about space or something. Um, and so there's, you know, we kind of do what we need to do to make sure that the book is realistic. And I always say, if somebody is reading that book and they see themselves on the page, I want them to see themselves in an honest and true way. Um, and so if that means, again, cramming chemistry so I can make a bad joke about, a, I was going to even retell the joke and I don't remember what the element's called, but um, you know, that that I think is is part of making a book meaningful to someone. Um, this is so true. Like I, so I think I blame Sherry Thomas for this, but she always 
writes these characters to fall in love over shared interests. And that is how I sort of became obsessed with the idea of people finding something in common. And that's not necessarily like the way people fall in love. I have a, my husband and I have very little <laughs> shared interests, like professionally. I mean, we, we there are things that we like to do together, but like he has never read a romance novel in, life, in his life. It's just not what he's into. And I will never read his academic books because I don't understand them. But like, um, I love to write about that. And so usually if you want a shared interest for two people, you have to know a little bit about that. And uh, that is devastating because there's so much research for it. And it's uh, like what Denise said is resonates so much because it's literally for three lines. Usually it's just so that you have enough context that you can like believably depict them there. And you're like, whoa, this took me so long to figure out, like hours and hours. And now I have one line. Um, and the book that I'm writing right now, the one that I'm editing, it was the book, like it's set in a world that is not, I just had no, I thought it was cool, but I know I had no previous real knowledge of, and it was so much research. And now as I am editing, I'm like, why did I write five paragraphs about like everything that they have to, like no reader is going to care about this. But at the time for me, it was how I was telling myself the story, you know? And so now I have five paragraphs of like explaining, uh, I don't know, the workings of a pool, for example. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> so going off of that, do you, I'm sure you all have like one or two weird stories of some weird corner of the internet you ended up on where you were like, what is this random thing that I now know off the top of my head? Uh, so in technically yours, the hero court is a cat dad. Um, and he has a 15 year old hairless cat named Peach. And I am not a cat. I don't have cats. I'm allergic to cats. I, I'm not a cat person. But I had to do a lot of research, which quickly turned in to landing on the side of TikTok that's just hairless cats being bathed. Um, for one scene that we ended up actually cutting from the book. Um, it's in the bonus content because I needed other people to know everything I had learned about bathing this cat. And they wear like little hair, like shower caps. It's adorable. But that was a weird corner of the internet for a non-cat person to be on. And now I want a Sphinx cat and my everyone in my family says no. And, and so it's a whole thing. Um, there are many other weird corners of the internet I have gone into for book research, but um, that now I have all this cat stuff around me and that's a very new thing for me. Okay. But I, I think they are so cute in the, in their slightly ugly way, but like, I love them and I think you should get one. They're like and... little chicken cutlets. Exactly. <laughs> they are so cute. Please. Everyone around you is wrong. You need to get a hairless cat. Okay. Thank you. Just they saying. also don't do well in Iowa cause they get very cold, but. Oh, uh, but. In, oh, in the house, it'll be perfect. Um, I feel like the, I don't even know. I mean, I, I remember once Googling like what kind of droppings uh, guinea pigs would, would like, would leave. And I was like, how, why? Like, how is this my life? But in a, in a nice way, like I was happy about it. And I was like, oh, this is my life, I guess. I went down a very weird rabbit hole looking for um, complex um, back of car positions. Um, I wanted it to to feel a particular scene in Pride and Protest to feel really real, but the people were big, you know? And, and I'm like, well, how is that? Like, I went to dealerships, you know? <laughs> and I also just... To this day, when I'm like, just Google, if I put in car, um, Google will auto correct. It's just like, you want to you want to know about some car sex? We got it. And I'm like, no, no, please. I'm just just looking for a Tesla. Like, Google oh, knows everything. Google's all up in your secrets. Google auto corrects all of this, and I'm just like, that was a time in my life. Google, like, stop judging me about it. It's been years. Yeah, so definitely like car positions. I was googling hard. Okay, so they know me. Right. I'm on a database. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Like all the mystery writers probably end up on some database. Oh yeah. Like best ways to kill someone. They yeah. are being like they are being watched. <laughs> I, I'm sure. <laughs> so on a more serious note, to completely pivot, is there something 
um, about romance that allows you to talk about more serious topics, you think? Is that something you were drawn to in the genre or something you've discovered while writing the genre? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think romance is so big. Romance covers everything. I mean, if you want to read serious social commentary while people are hitting it, you can read that. And if you want to read a soft, cozy, closed door Amish story of people falling in love, you can read that too. What I love about romance is it's possible, and in my books, I, I do this a lot, to talk about social issues that are really meaningful to me, but more importantly, social issues that touch readers. Um, and then I think what we get to do in the genre is something that's so powerful is we get to give those people a happily ever after. So the number of people, I, I couldn't have imagined this, the number of people I heard from who had lived through relationship violence or workplace sexual harassment or both, and what it meant to them to see themselves in a happy, fun love story with an honest voice of healing. Um, and that's just one book. I think we all do that in our different books, but we get to show a happy ending. We get to show a resolution. But also I could write all the essays I want on workplace harassment and, and violence in academia. And a lot more people are going to read it in a romance novel. And so as we think about the issues, again, they're important to us and that touch so many of us. Romance is a really powerful genre, and it always has been. I taught a whole class on this, so I will cut myself off. But we talked about that for a whole semester, the power of the genre and the reach of the genre to talk about all kinds of things, most importantly, love. Honestly, Denise said it. I mean, I don't think there's, there's much more to add to that, but there's a real power in being able to speak, um, speak truth to power structures and still give people a, a soft place to land. There's, it's, it's like that story of the court jester who could tell the king all the things that was wrong that were wrong with the kingdom without getting his head chopped off. Um, that you're you're in a particular position to speak the truth because it is clothed, you know, quite literally in love. Yeah, it's uh, it makes me think of you know we're, you were talking about Kennedy Ryan oh. earlier and like Kennedy Ryan, there are like she puts certain you know, really heavy themes in her books, but which are very, you know, they're very hard when you're reading them, but by the end of the book, you have been, like your heartache has been healed. And that is so important. Like it's, it's I can't even imagine uh, for people who, for example, have gone through a similar thing, how cathartic it must be to read about someone like them going through that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that, uh, for me, like reading romance novels for me is so meaningful, sometimes because of what the people go through in romance novels. And I think the one other piece of that is that historically romance has been written off as a genre that lacks meaning, that is not literary, that isn't doing important work. And that, again, that is not true today. It never has been at any point in history been true. But I also think that as folks like start to see some of the pieces and unpack it, I think it challenges that um, that problematic view of the genre and of, again, stories about love. Yeah, I think that was really well put. It's very cool to see three very smart, intelligent, wonderful ladies who can incorporate all the fun in romance, but also the social commentary and that the genre allows women and also men to do so it's very cool um so we are going to transition from my questions to audience questions um so i've got a couple here um so the first one's for ali um as a fellow scientist, I'm wondering how you fit both careers together, how you make time for writing, and how you queried and um, submitted your pieces while also being in the science world. How did academia react? And have you, it sounds like you write full time now. Yeah, now I write full time. So basically, the bottom line is that I couldn't make them work together, but I also have very, very poor like time management skills. So, like there are people who, you know, are Denise, for example, like uh, who 
ever been able to do that much better. So don't it doesn't mean that you can't do both. Like it doesn't mean that you can be an academic and uh, and be a writer. I'm just bad at it because I waste so much time doing things that I can't even tell you. I'm like, how is it already like 9 p.m.? What what has happened? Um, I I was very lucky also for the querying part. I didn't query because I was writing fan fiction and sort of my agent approached me. I was so lucky. She's amazing. She's a nerd. She reads fan fiction and she liked mine. And so she was like, let's let's see if we can publish together. And then uh, what was the third part of the question? Uh, oh, yeah. How Academia reacted. I, I didn't tell people or people found out actually, but not until I was I had quit my job. I, I was absolutely living a double life. And uh, it was my Hannah Montana life. <laughs> You know, I will say I was shocked how positively I didn't really keep it a secret. Um, but the number of people who on my camp, college campus, like administrators, faculty, the president of the university, even like who were so supportive and were like, oh, I'm reading romance, too. Or this is my first romance novel. Or how do you write the love scenes? That was an awkward conversation with a superior. But, um, you know, like I was I was sort of shocked how receptive and positive people in academia were um and if they weren't I was like well my book came out with public uh, penguin random house so how you live in um and you know I think there's that but it's definitely possible it's yeah. true like sorry I, I I just wanted to add I I didn't tell anyone but then when they found out like no one came to me and was like you brought shame upon our institution like they were fine with it sorry Nikki no 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 that's true I I, um, in the academy, a few folks knew that I was like kind of writing, but I was writing a lot of sci-fi back then. And they're just like, that's respectable. <laughs> but, um, but currently now in the work that I do, just, just absolutely not so hard. Do you know what I mean? Just absolutely not so hard. Um, just definitely still in my hand in Montana. I like the double life. That's very oh, yeah. cool. Absolutely secret life. Um, Nikki and Denise, because we already touched on this with Allie, is what is the importance of fanfic in your lives? Do you, I mean, you write it with your characters, but do you write it about anything else? Read um, it? I'll be real honest. I didn't truly know what fanfic was until I got into the romance game. Uh, it just wasn't how I, like, I just wasn't exposed to it. So it's not something I came up with as a writer. So I don't know that it has really an influence for me other than it knowing it brought so many of my favorite people into writing. And I'm thankful for that. Um, but for me, it wasn't part of my journey. It's just never something I was exposed to till I Googled it. So I didn't look dumb at a romance convention. <laughs> um, I can't like, I cannot express to you how, like, Jeff, what we, the Jane Austen fan fiction community is just so immense. It is, it is the, probably the largest fan fiction community, just thousands and thousands of groups, subgroups, um, Jane Austen fanfic that does this, Star Wars Jane Austen fanfic. It is huge, it is rhizomatic. Fan fiction was the origin of my career and is honestly I'm still writing fan fiction if you squared you know what I mean it's it's absolutely uh, Jane Austen fan fiction is is huge it's its own universe Bridget Jones is Jane Austen fan fiction um it just looks different right because it's foundational and you know people imagine that fan, fan fiction um you know has to come from a certain type of uh, media but the Jane Austen universe is huge and the fan, fan fiction created from the Jane Austen universe clueless it's Jane Austen fan fiction, right? I mean, it's it's well said. Um, the next question is about dialogue. Do you hear the different voices in your head, or is it more seeing dialogue on a page? How does it come to you? It's vibey for me. It's 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 very vibey. I. I hear it, I, I read my work out loud because I feel like I'm an uh, audio processor. And so I will read it out loud to, to get a sense of how it's supposed to sound. 
Um, and if it doesn't sound right when I am reading it aloud, I just take it out. It's just like a weird thing when you read it, you hear it differently than how you wrote, how you wrote it. And so, yeah, I like to hear it. And then if it, if it checks, if it checks that vibe box when I hear it, then I keep it. Um, I think, you know, I kind of hear it in my head, but I, it's not like I hear specific voices. I haven't like fan cast it. It's more like, you keep saying the vibes and I, I drive a lot. I commute 45 minutes each way to work every day. And so I do a lot of my kind of brainstorming and thinking through things in the car and all the best lines for all my favorite heroes came to me in the shower. So I guess like the shower is my hero grand gesture zone I don't know what to read into that but um I'd agree like it is it is more vibes I don't have to be writing it to hear it oftentimes I think of maybe my favorite favorite narrator and I can sort of hear them narrating it and that's sort of how I can kind of hear some of that dialogue um well I like the shower truly is uh, the best place and I think it's because you cannot write it down immediately you know so your brain is like, huh, I'm going to give you the breakthrough you've been waiting for when you cannot write it down. Yeah. So that is very annoying. But yeah, like for me, I think it's the same. I wouldn't say yeah, your voices. Uh, it's it's more about what it looks like on page. But sometimes I will think about, you know, vibes. Yeah, vibes is the best answer. <laughs> vibes and showers. <laughs> I work on this. <laughs> okay. All right. Um. Is it hard to cut out uh, words, passages, scenes um, you've written? And do you feel a loss when you're having to cut those? Or is it more transformative? It's sad. Because it's a lot of work that you put into writing it. I think as, I don't know about you guys, but now that I am like not, it's not my first book anymore. I am starting to get to a point where I want to try to polish my first draft so much so it hurts less uh, when I'm cutting stuff because I always I'm always an overwriter who has to cut down so yeah it's not easy <laughs> you know it hurts but I, I I'm an achiever like if you've taken Gallup Strengths that's my number one by far and so once I have a goal I'm pretty mercenary I'm actually like pretty um cutthroat in cutting things out of my book once I have a goal or some direction or what I have to cut. And I, I guess I just always sustain myself knowing that much like the cord bathing his cat scene, I'll put it in bonus content. It'll, I'll put it out there. But once I kind of have that goal in mind, that becomes so much easier because I can then see like, here's how much better it's going to be when I make these cuts. And I cut a a sex scene out of my mm. out of technically yours like at the very end of editing and I think my editor was shocked that I voluntarily did that um, but again I was like you know it, it's to the better good of the book and then then I'm pretty cutthroat about my own work yeah I I slowly get like I start off like every morsel is important and then like by the end like by the time I'm I'm editing I'm like in the like f them kids you know <laughs> You know, exactly. I, I literally just get there. I start from <laughs> my beautiful, precious thing, and then I end and just like cut it. I hate them. Get it out. Of, you know, I always I don't care anymore. In different in different places. So yeah, by the end, by the time I'm in like maybe second or third round of edits, I'm just like, you know, get it out of here. All right, I love it. <laughs> um, do you all have, if you had to pick? a favorite character or favorite two characters that you've written? Bear. <laughs> I just, I, 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 he just chased me around the room. I, I literally love him so much and it's problematic. I, I'm just, I, sometimes I'm trying to write, I'm writing a whole new character and like Bear still just hangs out in the Shays Lounge and he just like, Takes up so much space. He really Nikki, does. leave Bear alone. Uh, he is where he needs to be, okay? <laughs> yeah. This is a Bear stun account. Uh, leave Bear alone. Whew. Bear is my answer. <laughs> I feel um, like that's not fair, Haley, and I'm going to reject the question, <laughs> but um, I'm working on my 11th book right now, and so I just I feel like I have different favorites for different vibes and different moods and different spaces, but probably my overall favorite hero is Wes from The Fastest Way to Fall. And he's so broken and a cinnamon roll and 
just loves the heroine so much. And I really, he's the first uh, man point of view character that I wrote. So there's a special place in my heart for him. And then RJ Brooks, who is my heroine in Do You Take This Man is probably my favorite heroine because she's a badass at the beginning. She's a badass at the end. She suffers no fools and people really love her or hate her. And there's just something so delightful for me. And, and I kind of see myself in that. And that's probably why I adore her so much. I loved her. Like, I truly loved her. Yeah. Um, For me, it's the the two characters from my YA. I, I just, I don't know. Like, you know, when you asked us earlier, do your characters come to you fully formed? I said no, but like, those two did. Like, I don't know why they were young. They were messy. I, I love them. Mallory and Nolan are just, um, I love them so much. And uh, uh yeah, I... I know they will be happy now and uh, that that makes me happy every once in a while i tell myself at least mallory and nolan are happy hashtag mallory for life <laughs> yeah um i love it what advice would you give to an aspiring writer I just uh, uh, was at a panel uh, the other day and they asked us this, so I have the answer at the ready. And it really is like just build a community. Um, there are a lot of different ways to, to do that. Uh, you know, there are online forums. You can go on Twitter. You can find queering communities. You can find drafting communities, but like really build community. It's the most important thing. These are the people who, when you really are like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to write this book. I don't think it's actually good, are going to like, slap you in the face and be like no you are gonna finish this book and you need them so that's my b biggest advice heavy heavy um, plus one get a team get a community i totally totally echo that um the advice i've been giving recently on panels is something that i think actually i wish i would have known this when i was writing my dissertation and in many other aspects of life but that's that the only thing a first draft has to do is exist um, and so like write the book, put the words on page, show them to other people because your first draft, all it has to do is be there and you can fix it from there. But if it's not there, you can't do anything. So if you want to write the book, write the book. If you want to write the poem, write the poem. If you want to learn about chemistry, better you than me. Um, but you know, go, go do the thing and, and try it and then get better. Well, great advice. Um, Okay, we'll close it up with anything you all can offer us sneak preview wise about your next work. I know you just released books, all of you, but I imagine there's something else in the works. So if you have an update, please, please share. Uh, well, my next one won't be out for a little while. It won't be out till spring of 25 but it takes place in Iowa, which I'm super excited about because yes, there are black people in Iowa. Uh, and it uh, is sort of a um, fake dating with a lottery winner and a saving a donut shop and kind of two idiots who can't get out of their own way. And I'm, I'm editing it now. So I'm in that place where I, I hate everything about it, but I also love everything about it. So I'm very excited to bring you um, Love and Donuts. It's actually called Just Our Luck. So that'll be out spring 25. Um, and then I don't know, I'm probably gonna release some steamy bonus content that may or may not feature hairless cats along the way. I am writing a unhinged murder mystery where my detective has to be paired with a crime documentary junkie who thinks she knows the the way the ways of the world but uh spoiler alert she does not and it is pure comedy and it's very steamy and they also solve the case you didn't say who the detective is the detective if you all have read pride and protest is maurice bennett he grown. Maurice is grown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am. Uh, I found this out like three days ago, by the yeah. way, guys. And I've been thinking about nothing else <laughs> because <laughs> Maurice has my heart. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh, my next book is coming out in June and it's called Not in Love. And it's a, it's not a rom-com. It's kind of like a sad book, I would say. But yeah, it's a happy ending, of course. They end up together. Uh, it's a romance. Uh, um, and it's about... Um, yeah, it's it's about, uh, you know, 
uh, this girl who is a food scientist and this boy, I say girl and boy, they are in their 30s, I think, uh, who, um, uh, who is part of the private equity firm that was trying to take over uh, the company she works for. And uh, they meet on like a dating app or on a, on a hookup app and they hook up and then they figure out that, oh no, he's my enemy at work. Uh, and, uh, you know, that one of those things. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, thank you all three of you for your time and all your very cool answers. It was so nice getting to know each of you and your writing processes a little bit more. Um, we unfortunately have to close up the Zoom. So I'd like to thank all of the libraries that uh, paired up with us for this presentation. But most importantly, obviously, Denise, Nikki, and Allie for joining us for this lovely, lovely evening. I had so much fun. I hope everyone else did too. Um, have a wonderful evening thank you so much for having us so. thank you thank you to everybody for being here and always great to hang with Allie and Nikki always bye thank you